thanks the Historical Society for the invitation today. I appreciate it. Um, so I just wanted to start the talk with um, a quote from a great book. If you want to learn more about the Spanish influenza epidemic er here in the United States overall, and also kind of the evolution of medicine, um, this book, The Great Influenza by John Barry, is an outstanding read. So the quote from my, his book that I wanted to share with you was, um, nature chose to rage in 1918, and it chose the form of the influenza virus in which to do it. This meant that nature first crept upon the world in familiar, almost comic form. It came in masquerade, then it pulled down its mask and showed its fleshless bone. And just to put it in context, so humanity has known about influenza for centuries, way before 1918. And generally, what we knew about it was um, it came, it went, um, it impacted certain pop, uh, parts of the population, um, but it was never as bad as it was going to get during this time period. Um, so, and that the, this pandemic was no ordinary influenza. Let me see if I can figure out how to go down on the slides. Page down. I'm sorry. There. Okay, perfect. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. So as I mentioned, the, the Spanish influenza epidemic of 1918-1919, it was the most devasta devastating pandemic of the 20th century. The causative agent wasn't even known at that point in time, and it wasn't until the 1930s that um, researchers identified influenza A, H1N1 as the causative agent. Um, the pandemic infected over a third of the world's population, over 500 million people, um, and there were over at least 50 million deaths worldwide. Here in the United States, there were about 675,000 deaths, and if you put that in comparison to what, a, what you'd see in a normal influenza season, uh, about 550,000 of those deaths were excess, meaning beyond what you would normally see. The big hallmark of the Spanish influenza epidemic was its unusual severity and impact on young, healthy adults. Um, and then, as um, I think Rich had shared earlier and uh, Mary had talked about in their talks, the pandemic really occurred at a crazy, not ordinary time. So you put that on top of everything else. I'm not going to go into the background because I think um, this has been covered earlier today, but this is downtown Helena on um, October 24th, 1917. That's Main Street, which it does not even look like it anymore, um, but it's a military parade for the 163rd Infantry getting ready to leave for France. This is an enlistment promotion poster. And as Rich had talked about earlier, I mean, the social and political landscape in Montana and the United States was kind of crazy. Um, the level of patriotism was intense and the le level of xenophobia was intense as well. And then everything else going on between wheat production um, and getting prepared and um, um, sending men off for the war. Um, a big secondary thing that uh, related to the pandemic is with the war happening, um, the United States, and particularly in Montana, had a significant shortage of nurses and physicians. So you layer that on top, and then you have a, a, a very severe um, influenza coming our way. It's kind of uh, setting us up for disaster. I'm sure you guys have probably all seen this headline. This is the Helena Independent from March 24th, 1918, just demonstrating the level of paranoia. Your neighbor, your maid, your lawyer, your waiter may be a German spy. And I'm sure you've all seen the photograph below from Lewistown, where the community is burning German textbooks um, on March 27th, 1918. So all this is in the background um, before the pandemic hits. And then simultaneously, talked about earlier today, was you know there was a war in Europe, but there was also another war here in the United States between capital, um, the capitalists, and labor. So all this is going on um, while we're about to get hit with the worst pandemic ever. So just a little bit of background about what was the status of medicine and public health in Montana and the United States during this time period. So public health was super busy um, dealing with many other outbreaks and concerns. Um, going through the records from the State Board of Health and some of the local health departments, um, they were dealing with small smallpox, typhoid fever, measles, tuberculosis, scarlet fever, and many other things. 
1918, from the biennial report from the State Board of Health, they had over 15,000 reported disease cases that were reported to the Board of Health, super busy. So if you put that in perspective, currently here in Montana this past year, we had about 8,000 reportable disease conditions. Um, the big issue or kind of background issue was public health and medicine weren't prepared to deal with the pandemic that was gonna be coming their way. The other issue that really set them back, both medicine and public health was, this attitude that influenza was um, no big deal. You know, it would come and go, um, and the attitude was it's just influenza. So it'll come again next fall. You know, it'll infect some people. Sometimes it's bad, sometimes it's not as bad, um, but it's not that big of a deal. Um, in 1918, the cause of the, um, uh, the pandemic wasn't known. Um, there's no vaccine, no treatment, and no antibiotics to treat the pneumonias. So we really didn't have a lot of tools. In a normal influenza season, often you know, many people would get infected, um, but generally few died, and those who died generally were very young or very old. And just to put it in perspective of how um, important influenza was back then, influenza wasn't even a reportable condition for the State Board of Health, um, not until October of 1918. So just to get, give you a little background about what do we know about the origin and the spread of the pandemic, um, there's a few things we know pretty well from, from historic research, and there's some things that are still kind of hypothesis. Um, one is, and I'd ask you to kind of keep these in the back of your mind, um, we know there's three waves of the pandemic um, that happened in the United States. The first wave was in the spring of 1918, uh, between January and June. Um, during that wave, um, in selected communities across the state, many people got ill, um, but the number of deaths wasn't huge. So that's the first wave. The second and third waves hit in the fall, um, August and September of 1918 through um, June of 1919. That's the lethal wave of the pandemic where many people, um, it's likely in Montana up to 30% of the population became infected and became ill. And the mortality rate, as I'll show you a little bit later, soared. So three waves of the epidemic. Um, it's believed, and there's pretty good evidence for this, that um, the pandemic started in the United States and likely started in Haskell County, Kansas. Um, there was a very astute physician whose name was Lauren, Loring Minor, a uh, primary care doctor in Haskell County, Kansas, who had, he observed an outbreak of influenza at, with severe pneumonias in his community. Um, and actually, the date is wrong on this, but it was in February of 1918. He was so concerned about what he was seeing, he submitted a report to the U.S. Public Health um, Service. And this one sentence was put into the April 5th, 1918 public health report that went out to all the public health officials across the United States. Um, so it's likely he identified the origin of the epidemic. It's speculated that um, People from Haskell County, Kansas, who became, became ill, traveled to a local military camp called Camp Funston, which is about a couple hundred miles away, and likely infected troops there at that camp. And then the camp had a significant outbreak, and from there it spread to select communities across the United States. Um, and by, but what happened is, after that first wave in the spring of 1918, things started to calm down a little bit in the United States. There were sporadic illnesses, um, particularly in some communities, um, prisons and institutions, and mainly in military camps. But things began to calm down later in the summer. Um, but then um, the U.S. public health officials began to uh, take uh, uh, some alarm about what was happening in Europe and other parts of the world. So one question we wanted to look at was, um, sorry, um, was there a first wave event in Montana? And going through our research, I think we were, we were able to identify, at least in Butte, yes, there was. So these are a couple newspaper stories about things that were happening in Butte um, in February and March of 1918. The story on your left um, documents uh, that likely about 20% of um, Butte residents were down with influenza and pneumonias um, in the last week of March. Um, things got so bad, the story in the center from the Butte Miner describes that pneumonia is claiming many. The deadly disease is follow, uh, follows an epidemic of La Grippe, which was another name for influenza, and it swept over the city, and many victims were called. 
The story here on the right um, describes um, Lieutenant Governor McDowell, who was down um, in Butte doing business, actually became infected with the virus and he had uh, severe pneumonia. Fortunately, he survived. Um, and there were a number of other newspaper stories about the impact of the pandemic or that outbreak in Butte of how it had impacted the workforce. One story said that um, over 1,400 miners were out ill who couldn't work because they had influenza. And if you remember the old days with the telephone operators plugging in the lines, um, they were having trouble keeping up with um, connecting telephone calls because many of the telephone operators were sick as well. So it looks like um, at least Butte and Butte, uh, we had a first wave of the epidemic in Montana. So I'd just like to introduce you to this gentleman. His name is U.S. Uh, Civilian Surgeon General Rupert Blue. He was in charge of the U.S. Public Health Service, um, not the military component, but all of the public health service uh, for the public health support for the United States. So one question that comes up a lot was, was America kind of aware and prepared for what was coming their way? Um, and so the second and lethal wave that I mentioned to you guys earlier um, hits the United States at the end of August in 1918, and it hits Boston first. And it wasn't until August 9th of 1918 that the U.S. started to take notice that influenza was prevalent in Europe, Hawaii, and elsewhere. The Surgeon General, or Surgeon General Blue, put out a notice on August 16th, 1918, to alert U.S. quarantine stations. Basically what he said was, if you have ships coming into your um, ports um, and they have ill passengers, do not let anybody off the ship until the health officers are notified so they can do something. Um, the first cases of pa uh, Spanish influenza hit um, Boston on August 27, 1918, um, and the first death in Boston was September 8th. So that second kind of deadly lethal wave of the pandemic has hit the United States and starts to roll. The amazing thing was the first death in Montana from our review of records it, um, happened just 15 days later after that September, after September um, 8th. Um, it was a three-year-old American Indian child up in Browning, Montana. So it didn't take long for the virus to move across the United States and spread. So one question that comes up is, um, and I think you'll see throughout this, and um, so why was America not prepared for the pandemic? And one big reason was um, because the government was solely focused in looking to Europe and the war and um, dealing with the war and not thinking about something could come back to us um, that would be this bad. So these two newspaper articles are just notes from the first accounts of the pandemic hitting Montana. Um, the first was from the Helena Independent from September 20th, um, basically documenting and talking about what's happening in Boston, that many people are ill and there's many deaths. Um, in this um, document, um, there's recommendations from Surgeon General B Blue about what to do. Um, basically, his recommendations are if you feel like you're getting ill, go to bed and get some rest, get fresh air, have abundant food, and call a physician. So all good, good advice for anybody. This story on the, your right is from the Glasgow Courier from October 4th. And it's pretty much the first notice of the first cases in Montana and talks about um, the number of people, like in Wolf Point, over 50 people are infected and ill. And in Scobie, Montana, um, 100 people have become ill with Spanish influenza. The one interesting note in this article was um, the local physicians quoted as saying um, that some community residents are becoming needlessly alarmed that, um, about this um, the virus and the pandemic, but he basically said there's nothing mysterious about this germ, it, which is well recognized. It's only the complications that apparently result fatally. So again, it's this kind of theme about it's just influenza. It'll come and go, um, and it'll be gone soon. There's also a number or a couple articles from Northeast Montana and the newspapers speculating about why it hit this portion of the state likely first. Um, some of the speculation was cattlemen were taking cattle to Chicago to slaughter, um, became ill in Chicago and came back and then transmitted the virus back to uh, Scobie and Ponywood and those towns. So just wanted to share with you a little bit about, there's been really good historic studies already published about Spanish influenza in Montana. 
Um, one by Pierce Mullen and a colleague, and then Volney Steele from uh, Bozeman, I believe, did one as well. The one thing, when we started to dig into this and um, got the assistance, the lovely assistance from the Research Center folks, Zoan and everybody, um, we started to find some holes. One hole was um, there was no real analysis of what was the toll of the pandemic on Montana, at least uh, as on mortality. Um, and so what our goal for this project was is to basically assess what was, what was the burden of this pandemic on Montana, tell some of the stories about how it impacted people and communities, but also looked a little deeper about what was uh, public health's response at this time to try to address the pandemic and ask was it effective. And also as a public health practitioner, you know, in my current job is thinking about this now and if this happened now, how could we be prepared so we, um, it's not as bad as it was back in 1918. And I'm not going to go through this in detail other than we reviewed all the death records from 1918 and 1919 um, to identify deaths associated with influenza. We also reviewed death records from 1928 and 1929 um, from the Office of Vital Records at the Department of Public Health and Human Services. We did that year as well to have a comparison period for a, when a, there was a non-pandemic period so we could say how bad was it in a normal year versus the pandemic year. Uh, I don't know if you can see this very well, but this is actually a copy of one of the death records um, that we reviewed from that time period. And a couple things I just wanted to highlight. Um, so this individual, Joseph Herman, I'm gonna talk to you about him a little bit later in the presentation. Um, one thing is they had really good curves of handwriting back then, so I give them thumbs up. Um, <laughs> no way we'd be able to do this today. Um, so you can see on the right-hand side of that slide in the middle is his cause of death, Spanish influenza. He had it for nine days duration. He died on October 27th. On the other side of the slide, you can see it has his occupation. He was a, a ranch hand and sheep um, herder um, of German origin. And I'm going to come back and talk to you a little bit about him more in the presentation. The other thing we recognized going through death records back then. This is all paper copy, so we're going through lots of paper copies. And they're the original death records that are in our vault. Is um, It kind of blew me away. The leading cause of death um, in, at, during this time period was violence and injury. Um, it was pe op occupational injury, deaths, um, people killing themselves, people killing other people. Um, it was uh, pretty alarming to look at, but that was the leading cause or the most common cause of death was injury. The other thing that blew me away was it kind of reinforces um, the importance of m how many kids, um, young kids, you know, less than five years of age died from vaccine preventable diseases, you know, scarlet fever, kids dying from measles and those kind of things. So just to remind, I'm just putting my uh, public health message out there. <laughs> yeah. um, so the first wave again hits Montana. Um, in January through June. And during that time period in 1918, we had 53 total deaths, not that many. Um, the first death was among a 103-year-old woman from Carbon County. She lived at the Carbon County Poor Farm on January 16th. Of those 53 deaths, about 50% were in Silverbow County. Again, kind of giving you a hint that maybe we did have a first wave event and it was a little more severe. Um, <clears throat> one thing that sticks out when we dug into and looked at the data a little more deeper is of the folks who died in 1918 during that first wave, the average age of those who died was 33 and a half years of age. If you compare that to the 1928 time period, the average is 43. So there's a big shift <clears throat> in the age of those who um, died. Again, a hint <clears throat> of something different because that doesn't normally happen for, with influenza. So if influenza was a reportable condition back in Montana at that time period, and if our State Board of Health actually had enough staff with the right training, they, um, these are some hints that something different's happening and they might want to um, start looking into this and getting prepared for it. But at this time, um, the State Board of Health um, didn't even have an epidemiologist to do kind of this basic analysis. So the, <clears throat> the second wave, Again, the second wave of the pandemic hit Montana in September of 1918 and went through June of the next year. Um, the first influenza death was among a three-year-old American Indian boy named Woodrow Lazy Boy from Browning. He died on September 23rd. Two days later, there's a death among a 15-year-old girl in Scobie, Montana, and an 86-year-old retired rancher in Great Falls. 
And then just a few more days later, um, things start to brew up in the northeast part of the, the state. There were five additional deaths. So that tsunami of the pandemic coming across Montana has begun. And so over the next 10 months, <clears throat> there'd be a total of over just under 4,200 deaths um, in the state from Spanish influenza. So I'm going to explain this graph to you. Um, this figure is the number of, just the number of influenza deaths in two week time periods from, in Montana from September 1918 through June 1919. And then that's the dark gray wave. And then the light gray bar at the bottom is the same time period from 1928 and 29. And so as you can see, um, it just took off in terms of deaths. That, that zero over here, this is the last two weeks of September. And so um, that's when the first deaths were up in the uh, northeast corner of the state. And then it, it just explodes. Um, the two-week period that had the most deaths was October 20th through November 2nd. So if you go back 100 years ago and a week, um, that was when we had the most deaths from Spanish influenza. So if we were going back in time, we'd be about right, right here at that point in the curve. <clears throat> and just to put in perspective, the, low, the light gray bar on the bottom, that's what would be normally expected. And that's kind of, we had a bad influenza season last year um, where lots of people hospitalized and more deaths than we normally do, but it would be a bump like that and not like the Spanish influenza pandemic. So the pandemic didn't hit the state equally um, across, across the state. So this figure just shows the death rates um, by county um, it, during the second and third waves of the pandemic, and it's the mortality rate per thousand. And so counties that have the darker blue um, have higher mortality rates. So the overall mortality rate for Montana was 7.7 um, .7 deaths per thousand. So basically, for every thousand people in Montana, eight people died from Spanish influenza. Um, but there was a significant variation in the range. So Silver Bow had the most deaths and the highest death rate um, at 12.9 per thousand. And then Sanders County had the lowest, I believe it's 3.1 deaths per, um, per thousand. So quite a bit of variation across the state. So if you compare the statewide mortality rates during that second and third wave in 1918, 1919, to 1929, 28 and 29, a non-pandemic year, um, the mortality rate was nine times higher from Spanish influenza during that pandemic. And the other thing that really sticks out, and I'll show you a little bit more information about it, is in 1918, 1919, 75% of the deaths were people aged 15 to 44, so healthy adults. In a non-pandemic year, it would be, it was 25%, and often it's even less than that. So big difference on impact on healthy young people. So this figure just shows the mortality rates um, by age. So the age groups are on the bottom in, the, in little buckets, and it's the mortality rate per 100,000. And um, the dotted line is 1928 and 1929, and that's what you normally see in a normal um, influenza season. Um, mortality rates higher for the very young, very old, and super low for um, young, healthy adults. The hallmark of the Spanish influenza epidemic um, was this weird shaped W curve where um, it had a significant impact on healthy young adults and they actually had the highest mortality rate. I believe it's 25 to 34 year olds. So just a little more data um, we wanted to share with you about what we pulled from the death records. So of those 4,200 deaths, about 3,500 were um, adults who were 18 years of age and older. Um, 34 of those deaths were soldiers and one was a sailor. Um, and going through some of the records and getting some information from some of my public health colleagues, um, many of those soldiers um, died. There was a significant outbreak in Fort Missoula. They had a bad outbreak of influenza there. They actually quarantined the fort. And many, I think half of those soldiers were actually stationed at Fort Missoula. Um, 25 physicians, nurses, and hospital staff died. Many of those folks that probably got infected by treating patients. Um, during this time period, and I'll, I'll share a little more information with you later, is schools were closed across the state because of the pandemic. And so they, um, communities asked teachers to volunteer as nursing aides. And so 40 teachers 
also died from Spanish influenza, and many were likely were volunteering as nurses in the community to help other families. Um, the other thing was 10% of deaths, of, of deaths among women of childbearing age during this time period, 10% of those deaths were pregnant women. And um, it's known now that pregnant women are at high risk for influenza and influenza-related complications. So now I just wanted to shift a little bit from the data just to kind of talk about you know, personal stories and impacts on the community. And I just had a couple examples here. So the sto newspaper story on the right is from the um, Twin Bridges Independent from December 13th, and it talks about the death of three sisters, the Stallcup sisters, whose names were Winnie, Ruth, and Jenny. They were aged 26, 27, and 32. All three of the uh, Stallcup sisters were teachers in the community in Madison County, um, and they all they died w within two days of each other. Um, the story here on your right is about Dr. Blake, about the impact on physician and, uh, physicians and nurses in the community. So this is a November 1st, um, 1918 issue of the Dillon Tribune. And it talks about uh, a little about um, the death of um, Dr. Charles Robert Blake Sr. He was 33 years of age. He had moved to Butte to do his internship at Murray Hospital, and then he moved to Dillon to start his medical practice. And I'll just read a quote from the newspaper article. When the present ep epidemic of Spanish influenza broke out there, there were only four physicians in the city. In addition to Dr. Blake's regular practice, he answered calls from many stricken ones, and he was on the go almost constantly. Um, the overwork made him easy prey to the disease. So Dr. Blake, again, 33 years of age, he was survived by his wife, Elizabeth, who was 32, and his two children, Elizabeth and Charles, who was aged three and one. One interesting connection I made just from looking at this and then looking at some other information from the Butte archives was um, Dr. Blake's wife, Elizabeth, her main name was Groenwald, and she, her father was a pastor in Butte at this time period. And Butte had, you know, things are always interesting in Butte. So I have a little, some interesting tidbits about the pandemic in Butte coming up. Um, but he was um, complained to the Butte City County Board of Health. Butte initially shut everything down except bars and saloons when the pandemic hit. And he was outraged that they would shut down a church but not shut down the bar and the saloon. So it's interesting the ties between these two communities. And then the story in the center <clears throat> just highlights the impact on whole families. Um, this is a story from the Helen Independent about <clears throat> 17 children who were orphaned because both of their parents were killed from Spanish influenza. So a significant impact on families. The other thing I wanted to share was kind of just some examples of the cross between the, the intersection of the war and the pandemic. Um, the story on the left in the photograph um, is uh, from the October 18th issue of the Glasgow Courier, and it's reporting on the death of Corporal um, Raf Auguste Raphael Save, um, who's on the, on the right with the beret. Um, Corporal Save was 29 years of age, and he grew up and lived in Seiko, um, but he was of French-Canadian descent. He saw action early in the war. Um, he was acting as a French interpreter for officers on the front line, and while in action, he was gassed by enemy forces and he was hospitalized in France, and he eventually was transferred back to Baltimore and discharged due to disability from um, the service. He came back to Montana in early October 1918, and within two weeks, um, he got infected with Spanish influenza. And as the story mentioned, he took sick from influenza, and since so much of his lungs were destroyed by, his, by the gas, his chance for living was handicapped from the very first. Interesting thing with this was doing a little bit of research on Ancestry.com, I was able to identify one of his relatives who shared that photograph, which I really appreciate. Um, and then another story, a different side of the story from World War I connection and the pandemic. So I, earlier I showed you that death certificate from Joseph Herman. So this is Joseph Herman, um, who died in October from Spanish influenza. Um, after the US entered the war, um, all German immigrants who were not U.S. citizens were required to register with the U.S. Department of Justice as alien enemies. So these individuals were required to carry these cards, um, and to, they had to register with the local postmaster um, to receive appro approval to travel from one district to the next. So this is um, Mr. Herman's um, alien enemy registration card. 
that actually was attached to his death certificate that now is part of the collection for here at the Historical Society. Um, so it has his fingerprint, and I don't know if you can read this, but these are the postmaster notes giving him approval to go do his job, which was ranch and sheep herder. He uh, went out of Cascade County up to Geraldine and moved quite a bit, so that gave him permission to actually move from registration district to registration district. So now I just wanted to shift a little bit and talk about, so what was the public health response to the pandemic, uh, and how did they do? So I don't know if anybody recognizes this gentleman here. People in hell will probably do, yeah. This is um, Dr. Cogswell, William Cogswell. He's, he was the longest serving executive officer of the State Board of Health. He served from 1912 to 1946. So he was in charge of the Board of Health at this time period, and the Board of Health was small, but they had a lot of responsibility. They coordinated um, disease prevention and control efforts across the state with counties and city health officers. Um, as I mentioned, the workforce was tiny. Um, they had a handful of employees here. Um, they had very little money, but they did the best they could. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the Board of Health was really busy with lots of other public health issues. One thing that the Board of Health was battling at this time was they were battling with anti-vaccinationists who um, the board had allowed local counties to um, uh, require that school children and school employees have to have smallpox vaccinations to attend school, and they were battling anti-vaccination groups who didn't want to have that requirement. So busy with lots of other things. So was the Board of Health aware and prepared for what was coming? Um, bottom line was no. Um, they had no indication of the initial outbreaks in, uh, uh, in Kansas or that there was a wave of illness potentially coming their way. Um, the board was probably likely or probably aware of the pneumonia outbreak in Butte, particularly because the lieutenant governor became ill, um, but it, there was no hint in any of the board's minutes, meeting minutes or any of their bulletins that something bigger was coming. Um, as I showed you earlier, the number of deaths from influenza was only 53 in the spring of 1918. So again, no big concern for alarm unless they looked at that mean age of um, death. Um, there was no warnings from the Surgeon General Blue or the U.S. Public Health Service until it's too late. And really, um, the board looked back in hindsight from data they had and thought, oh yeah, we, there was a few things we missed that we, if we were looking and had staff to be able to dig into it, we might have had a clue that something bad was going to happen. So what actions did the board, board, State Board of Health take? Um, so again, if you remember, the first death in Montana was September 23rd, 1918. So the board called an emergency meeting here in Helena on August or October 9th, and they passed regulations to allow city and county health departments to close public places, everything from churches, bars, schools, saloons, um, everything. Um, they allowed, adopted regulations to isolate ill people and make the disease finally reportable to the State Board of Health. They also did a lot to promote the use of masks to try to prevent print uh, transmission, and they were um, communicating about, or potentially starting communications with the Mayo Clinic about a potential vaccine that could be brought into Montana to see if it would work. Um, they documented that this, between October and December in 1918, there were over 30, almost 38,000 cases reported. But as the Board of Health noted in their um, minutes, in many places of the state during the epidemic, the local health department completely broke down on account of the fact that the health officer was too busy responding to ill people to tend to his duties as health officials. So they knew um, 37,000 cases weren't anywhere close to what was really happening. Um, this is a story over on the right here in the, from the Glasgow Courier, and it's just basically a plea from Dr. Cogswell to the community to basically say, Please take care of your physicians, conserve their energy and time, and don't call after 10 o'clock unless it's an emergency. So. Um, and then just a highlight from, uh, this is um, Dr. Lewis Allier. He was the health officer for Yellowstone City County Health Department during the time. Um, who He would later on go on to do a lot here for um, setting up clinics and for services for disabled kids. Um, he became infected with influenza, and he it got so bad he was hospitalized in delirium. But fortunately, he survived, came back to work at the health department, and helped to deal with the rest of the pandemic later in 1919. So the State Board of Health, it was obvious from reading their minute, meeting minutes that they 
the prevention efforts were failing miserably, and so they shifted their focus to more on relief work. Um, the first thing Dr. Cogswell did was recognizing because of the war, we had a shortage of physicians and nurses across the state. He sent a request into the Public Health Service and the Red Cross to see if we could get more doctors and nurses. And just one thing to plug, especially since my wife's here and she's a nurse, um, doctors were great back then, but the real thing that kept people alive were the nurses. It was just the palliative care, hydration, and just that, taking care of it. So that was what we really needed. Um, the U.S. Public Health Service and the Red Cross provided a small number, eight, and, eight physicians and seven nurses. Cogswell also put out a plea to physicians across Montana to see if anybody could be volunteered from their communities, and 12 doctors responded. Um, this newspaper story here from the Helen Independent is the, uh, a story about one of those doctors who volunteered. His name was Alfred Dodge, and he was um, a physician from uh, Polson. He volunteered in November of 1918, reported to Dr. Cogswell, who shipped him out to Rappel G, Montana, which is a little ways from Billings. When Dr. Dodge got to uh, Rappel G, and this is quotes from this newspaper article, he found flu every, in every home. There were over 300 people ill, and there was no doctor or nurse in the community. So what he did was help organize and convert a school and a church into an emergency hospital. He identified volunteer nursing aides to help treat, um, take care of um, ill people, and then they used, it got so bad that they used a farm wagon as an ambulance. So just to also share some of the other images from that time period. So it got so bad because of the shortage of nurses and physicians um, that the Red Cross, again, as they always do, jumped in. This photograph on the left on the bottom is the uh, Red Cross volunteer chapter from Browning, Montana, who um, were aiding and treating ill people then. And it also got so bad because there were so few people to deal with this that um, they had um, Red Cross volunteers and teachers go out and canvas the remote rural communities just to check on people um, to make sure and see if they're even alive outside of the main communities. So they were trying to do everything they could. And then the other piece I want to share, it got so bad in Glasgow, um, they put out, one is they put out a, a plea to any women in the community who were not ill who could volunteer to help as nursing aides. Um, they praised the teachers who were working night and day to help take care of people. But, and I don't know the origin of the word slacker, but they loved the word slacker. <laughs> they called out a small group of women in the community who were not ill, and they said those, those slackers are on the blacklist. And then you can't see it, I'm sure, but they said they were probably up cleaning their attic and then making food for their husband and not caring for their community members. But um, I'll have to dig into the slacker word a little bit more. <laughs> So to, just wanted to come back to Butte, Montana, because things are always interesting in Butte. Um, so uh, in, during the first week of November of 1918, um, in Silver Bow County in Butte, the number of cases being reported to the county started to decline, and the number of deaths started to go down. Um, so the Silver Bow County Board of Health decided, and they had lots of debate about this, they decided to remove the lid, and the lid being the closure of public places. So they allowed people, stores to open up again, um, and they allowed people to gather in public, to, in churches, schools, and everything. Um, and as you guys, as we've heard today, you know, um, today's, or yeah, Armistice Day. So arm, the Armistice was signed on the, um, November 11th, and that ended World War I. And so Butte, like many other communities, came out and had a big parade. So this is an image from the Armistice Day Parade down in Butte. Um, so this, um, but as maybe some people would predict this, in the weeks that followed the celebration, um, the number of cases and the number of deaths from influenza went back up again. And I don't have any data to share with you, but the same exact thing happened in Missoula. They um, opened up public places. People gathered, they had a big parade, and then flu cases came back up again. So the plague came back, and nature started to rage against humanity again. So, uh, so at that point, um, when uh, the Silver Bow County Board of Health decided to say, we have to shut things back down again because it's getting worse. And so the interesting thing, and I'll hit a few tidbits from these two articles, was the city council at that point um, said, ah, no, we don't think you can do that. You, you never really had authority to close down things, places in the city. You can do outside city limits, but not in the city. 
So they got in a big fight with each other. It got so bad that um, the County Board of Health was going to um, go to um, Governor Stewart and asked um, to declare martial law to actually shut the town down. And as you can see here on the right, um, Dr. Cogswell stepped in and negotiated a truce, and the truce was actually on the behalf of the Board of Health, so they actually shut everything back down again. So it, nothing's ever simple in Butte. Um, the other thing I want to share too, because it blew me away, um, the Butte Archives has um, the County Board of Health meeting minutes during this time period, the handwritten meeting minutes. And the County Board of Health met daily from um, September, end of so September through January. Sometimes they met three or four times a day because they were dealing with so many issues. But I just want to share what the County Board of Health tried to do to address this um, pandemic. Um, they threw everything in the, but the kitchen sink at it. So, and this is in chronological order. So the pandemic hits. First thing that Butte, um, the Silver Bow County Board of Health does is they close all public places except saloons. Um, no large funerals, no large gatherings. All football games are canceled. Um, Streetcar windows had to be open, and this is in the middle of winter. Um, they then decided to say, okay, we're going to have to, you have to remove the card tables and chairs from saloons. So you can go in and buy packaged liquor, but then you got to get out. You can't, you know, loiter around and drink. Um, barbers were required to wear masks and fumigate at the end of the day. Undertakers um, were not to send bodies home for wakes. Again, no, they're trying to keep people separate from each other. Phone companies were required to dis disinfect public telephones. Um, it was required to have placards placed on houses. So if you had, you were in, uh, infected with influenza and you were ill, your house would say flu here on it to warn the public. Drug stores were asked to remain open longer hours. Um, the prison was, um, a prison established a hospital, which it didn't have before. Um, they were really concerned about the streets and about dust and dirt because they thought that had something to do with uh, what was happening. So initially they were saying sprinkle the streets to keep the dust down and then, then they came back and said, okay, flush the streets to clean whatever's in there. Um, the National Guard was called in to help reduce public crowding, to disperse crowds. Um, clerks, waiters, and waitresses were then also required to wear masks. Um, teachers were asked to volunteer as nursing aides, just like in many other communities across the state. Um, they required that newspapers, um, store advertising in newspaper could not use the word sale or bargain because that would entice people to go out. So um, they converted Washington Junior, Junior High School into an emergency hospital. And they also would, um, tested experimental vaccine on the prisoners there, which would never fly these days. Um, they again had to notify the newspapers to stop using the word sale and bargain because they still were doing it. Um, the election was coming up early in November here and they basically prohibited any um, political debates and they had no, they were not allowed to have any gatherings around polling places. You go in, you vote, you get out of there. Um, and then it, finally it got so bad with the unruly crowds that they brought military forces in to disperse people from in public places. Um, so they tried everything in the kitchen sink to try to address the pandemic. So just to conclude, um, you know, uh, during an extraordinary time, as you guys heard from the um, speakers earlier this morning and today, with all the things happening on, in, on the planet and in the United States in 1918, um, the, we were hit with one of the most extraordinary epidemics of the 20th century. And as you I hopefully conveyed with you, it, it, it exacted a dramatic toll. I think, Rich, you were saying a number of your relatives yeah, died from Spanish influenza. So humanity was raging against itself in World War I, and then nature chose to come back and rage against us. And at that point in time, there wasn't a lot that medicine and public health could do to um, be prepared for the assault. Um, although the response in communities around the state inclu included many inspirational and heroic efforts, the ep ep epidemic, as it did across the United States, pretty much ran its course with little hindrance, and uh, its toll would impact generations. And I just wanted to finish with, um, this is a quote from the 1919-1920 biennial report from the State Board of Health, and it's their reflection looking back on the pandemic. So, our memories of this and other epidemics should not fail 
Let us hope that through preparedness and health organization and in education of new generations, we may prevent our repetition of the ter terrific losses which influenza has cost in the past three years. So good advice. And after we worked on this project, I've had numbers of discussions with my coworkers about, well, how prepared are we? What will we do if, we get, if it gets to this level where we need to shut things down? Um, what if it gets to the point where the workforce is so ill that transportation to move pharmaceuticals? I mean, there's lots of different questions. So it's a good uh, review for us in public health. And then last thing, I just want to do a plug for one of my co-authors, Dr. Helgerson. Um, and Dr. Holtzman, who also worked on this project, um, Dr. Helgerson published this book, A Country Doctor in the Epidemics, um, last year. And it's basically a historic fiction about the pandemic um, hitting Forsyth, Montana, and Rosebud County. It's a great read. Um, and it, it's actually, um, he changed the names, um, so, you know, for those purposes. But it's a very good historic fiction read. And I believe they have it at the gift, um, gift shop, autographed copies of it. So if anybody's interested. So thank you.